Good evening and welcome to Africa News Network First Fast Live. And this is uh, the Monday edition of ANN7 Prime with me, Cindy Mabi. Our top story, First National Bank customers cry foul following the latest safety deposit heist. For six months, FNB clients believed that they had lost all their valuables. However, the bank was aware of the whereabouts of the supposedly stolen goods. The bank recovered coins, jewelry and foreign currency at both crime scenes. And at the bank's Randburg branch, 360 safety deposit boxes were stolen in December 2016. And in a separate incident in Parktown on New Year's Eve, robbers allegedly made off with 1.7 million rand in hard cash and also took valuables from over 30 boxes. Victims later found out that FNB had secretly retained some valuables recovered at the crime scenes. The bank failed to disclose the recovery to its clients. And some of the clients who lost their valuables are now planning on taking legal action against the banking giant. And let's take a closer look at the saga as it unfolds. A group of robbers allegedly took off with an estimated 1.7 million rand in cash and valuable goods belonging to various clients. The two heists took place in a matter of, of weeks. And victims in each incident were reportedly contacted three to four days after the robberies. And some of the victims found out about the robbery after attempting to deposit more valuables. And most clients were not aware or were unaware that their boxes were removed from the Four Ways branch to the Randburg outlet. FNB has refused to communicate if compensation will be given to victims. And joining us in studio is Udo Fuerza, independent political analyst and columnist. Good to have you and thanks so much for joining us. What is plaguing the banking sector? Not too soon have we seen, um, for example, the uh, currency fixing and collusion. And now we hear that FNB has uh, withhold or withheld some information from their clients. It's interesting what's happening in this country because it's been done like that before. Here's Barry Sargent with a book, The Cabo Collusion, in 10 fateful days in a 26 billion rand fraud. Investec Bank and Alan Gray stole, within 10 fateful days together with Brett Cabo, 26 billion rand from the banking sector. Okay. Can we Nothing then... was done about it. Exactly. Maybe we're going to come back to the, you know, the public protector Why was, was being criticised. Why was that not handed mm. to the SAPS? Correct. But I just want to come back to how the banking sector has in itself seemed to be a law on its own because we know that the public protector is now being criticized for making recommendations to amend the constitution mm. or the mandate of the Reserve Bank to better serve the larger po uh, population and all these other collusion that has also come out. Very little has been done, if not just a slap on the wrist. Well, the late author, Barry Sarton, already questioned why did the Treasury do nothing about it? Then another author, Steve Mitford, good son, who was a director, non-executive director of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, raised the same question, why is nothing done about the grand theft? So that started in 1976, if not earlier, until now and beyond. And then the banks, like in this case now, the FNB, turned around to its clients and said, why were you not insured? Why don't you get insurance? Mm. So Maybe, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the intricacies when it comes to the financial cluster, mm. let alone what it is that we sign in the mm. fine print. Mm. Uh, when you open up an account or you have an agreement with a bank, but it doesn't make sense to have a safety deposit box that has the potential of being stolen from what is supposed to be a very secure uh, sector. And it should be an inside job as well, because it's, it's very interesting that it's happened inside the bank. Correct. So, so now, okay, let's look at the recourse that clients possibly can have. We know that uh, they, they're now regrouping to see if there'll be any compensation. But again, it's the nitty gritties. The devil is in the detail. Uh, is there any recourse that clients have? The clients do have recourse. Indeed, they do. And they can go to court and, and, and they will exercise their recourse under the South African law. The South African law provides that protection. Yeah, but we're dealing with a giant here, a monopoly, so to speak, uh, that would have the, the luxury, yeah. exactly, mm. uh, of uh, a legal budget that mm. you and I possibly wouldn't be able to afford. So should, should there be a class action, or do you think that individuals even stand a chance? Well, there's an organization called New Era, which the clients can turn to, and they would be assisted by them. New Era has enough funds to, ass to assist.
mm. people have been done in by the banks. What, what success rate has there been, if, if you can cite some? Well, they, they, went to, they took on NetBank, and NetBank was, was certainly wrapped over the knuckles and had to actually st stay away from, from people's properties when they wanted to actually repossess them. Mm -hmm. But why, why would a bank want to conceal evidence that had been recovered because it, it does not belong to them and, and fail to communicate? Well, they were most likely are scared that it's bad for the image. Well, listen, the bank is not safe anymore. And now clients are going to court and claiming their good spec, their, their belonging spec. So there's huge uncertainty. And eventually one day, this could, this could, who knows, could end up in a run on the banks. Mm. But I mean, if, even if it were about uh, preserving its reputation, there is already a, a trust deficit by virtue of not communicating in time, mm. sitting with the critical information where uh, a lot of uh, investors felt that they had lost things that are not replaceable, you know, that don't have necessarily a monetary value. These are things of, of sentimental value uh, that had been passed on from generation to generation. So what kind of compensation, if at all, uh, is the bank obliged to give? Well, they, they evaluate those things most likely themselves. They, they say this, is, this costs so much to, in today's time. It looks like your great-grandmother's socks or your shoes or her ring, whatever it is. We cannot, this is not worth anything, it's a sentimental value, we will pay you 500 rand or something like that. So they get off kind of scot-free. Yeah. There's already uh, an organization or movement, civic organizations, that are looking at the practice of banks when it comes to illegal reposition, you know, repossessing people's homes mm. that may owe an appittance, you know, mm. having carried a mm. bond for mm. over 25 years. Uh, we've seen people being evicted illegally, but there's a mm. whole, it seems the value chain is so well organized that it is with the sheriff's office and uh, the realtors and certain attorneys and then we have uh, people out on the street effectively without any assistance. It the bank cartel of South Africa is merciless and I'm sure it's throughout the world they're, they're totally merciless they couldn't kill us it's all about profits brands and cents and that's it. Clients should be very vigilant because it's already been suspected that some of them already might have received bribes in order not to go to court. So banks, that shows you already, banks will stop at nothing mm. to, to do what they are doing, yeah. to, to well, retain the control. What do you mean the they control. have rights? You're saying that clients have, uh, I'm sorry, I missed that, in no, terms the, of the, what the, what clients the bank's must liability be is. Because already certain clients have been approached, according to them, mm -hmm. to, to actually take a bribe, not to appear in court, not to go to court for the, against the bank. My goodness. Okay, we're joined by Walter Lukuleni. He is the PAC Secretary for Publicity. Good evening to you, Walter, and thanks so much for joining us. I think there's a broader concern here in how people are uh, um, either victimized or they are unfairly treated by the banking sector. It's not the first that we've heard around uh, unlawful uh, repossession of property, etc., or clients not given the due right of response and also of defense. We're sitting now with a case where FNB failed to disclose information regarding stolen goods that was recovered from the two heists I mentioned earlier on. So I guess the, the, the best um, question would be what happens next, and especially in aid of the victims? Thanks, Cindy. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I, think, I think it's important to go back. Uh, th there's a lack of moral... Uh, uh, let's put it this way. The, the, the banks don't use uh, a, a moral, moral uh, standards in terms of looking at after their clients. You are basically a number, basically. That's the, I think that's where the, the, the problem starts. Uh, and... I would have expected that the banks would actually treat their clients with more care, and when such such things happen, they should they should be willing to assist their clients more than assisting themselves. You know, my take would have been that it's immoral for them to have hidden the information mm. for them. Yeah. But, but the, the broader thing, I think, suppose is the transformation that uh, the calls have been made for the banking sector to uh, be exactly that, more courteous, if you will, towards its clients and not necessarily uh, be only profit-driven, let alone that their, their shares are also listed uh, offshore. How much more does that complicate 
the the ability of the South African can, South African client to protect themselves if the banks have got so many other interests outside the country. I believe there should be a banker from the South African Reserve Bank, a banker from FNB, and a representative from the South African Police Force here tonight to debate it as well. But some insiders who actually would know exactly how this is done. Maybe somebody, some disgruntled observer who was inside. People like Stephen Goodson who would be able to give you a proper insight into what was really happening within the bank cartel. Banks are playing politics, for example. They funded the tickets of some of the opposition parties to travel to London and meet with, with people of influence in London. Those kind of things are unheard of. But then you go back in history to 1859, when HSBC Bank was formed, and uh, they, did, they did the majority of your drug money laundering. Mm. Whenever you hear of bank, bank scandals, you find that bankers, cops, and, and thieves actually all are together in it and uh, throughout the world and go to jail together. Yeah, but I mean, if this is general information that is out in the public domain, why is it there hasn't been any action taken against the bank? I think or South Africans are exhausted. I think South Africans in general are very exhausted. What do you think? I don't think South Africans are exhausted. I think, I think they don't have the means to, to go to, to the banks themselves. Mm. Uh, it's more the political will that is needed from government to actually uh, go to the banks because they, they, the masses don't have that power. Mm. So why doesn't the Treasury step in here and, and, and do its work, do its duties? Well, tre Treasury, uh, to use the, the popular term, is also captured. Of course. Yeah, so as Is it result, captured by policy or is it captured by individuals and in that whoever else steps in there doesn't have elbow room to maneuver and make a difference based on the, the framework and the policies that is there? No, it's captured by policy. The policy is created in such a way that even you, Cindy, you can come with the, with the, with the most high, high moral standards, but when you get there, you can't maneuver you are stuck within a system. The system is created in such that the banks literally run the country. And we told to tread very carefully yeah. because yeah. this is what could determine whether we have foreign direct investment or whether we're even uh, credit worthy if uh, the rest of the world looks at us, if we tamper with the banking sector and, and essentially the financial sector. They immediately send out their hit squads, the economic hit squads, such as the uh, ratings agencies, who then downgrade your, your rand value You've got the collapse of the RAND in 2002-2003 as documented by Barry Sargent, which was led then by Kevin Wakeford. You have many shenanigans. Here the, Afri the hit economic hitman, for example, written by John Perkins, gave a very good, and I think this paragraph actually sums it up with the banking sector in total. Mm. And I would like to quote, economic hitmen are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. The tools include fraudulent financial reports, rigged elections, payoffs, extortion, sex and murder. This reads better than any James Bond movie. And that's our banks. That's the global, that's the global bank banking sector. Mm. I mean, they're given even more powers now with the financial intelligence. Um, that's, yes. Uh, yeah, FICA laws. Correct. Mm. So, so that, you know, we're we almost helpless or defenseless towards this uh, Goliath. No, we are not. You know, no, I, disagree. I, think, I think you need, you, you need, need a, a government, strong treasury. You need a government that is courageous. Yes. Because I can tell you now, you can look at all the countries where mm. there's dictatorships. The mm. banks are still there. Mm. But it's a question of, are you willing enough as a government to move against them, to create rules that uh, help your citizenry? If you are not courageous, they will, rule, they will run it. But if you, you make laws, they don't run away. Yeah, but no. what are the ramifications in the short term, as I mentioned? In the short term, yes, they'll, mm. the rent will it's collapse, they'll take the money out, but they will not run away forever. Mm. It doesn't run away at all. Yeah. They will never run away at all because there's too much money involved. They will never yeah. run. Yeah. If, they could wash, if they could loan a drug money, they'll yeah. never run away from anything. But, but yeah. could, could this action by FNB be explained a way to say it may have been oversight, irresponsible, it's not necessarily criminal, there was no malice intended by not sharing uh, the, the crucial information with victims or this, this is just words to defend. This is a public relations exercise. Uh, I really believe, as, as my colleague here says, we need to make sure that the government is held accountable, that the authorities... There's enough evidence documented in, in all these books, to, and these are South African books, there's enough evidence to take all of them to court. There's enough evidence to really make sure that you pass laws to balance the FICA laws, that you balance the, the banking laws, mm. so that you can make sure that these banks are accountable 
with a very brutally count accountable. You don't don't just hit them with a with a marshmallow over yeah. the forehead. But but I mean, obviously, the government's responsibility is to ensure that there is safety and security, stability. We mm -hmm. have a conducive environment for economic growth, job creation, all of those wonderful things that you hear that they may not have the appetite mm -hmm. and may require civic organizations to take up that cause to say, look, as much as you've operated very nonchalantly or, mm -hmm. you know, you had carte blanche, as it were, in, in the country, this is where you, you now need to take responsibility. We, we don't seem to have that appetite. I don't think you'll get it from the current government. No civic organizations for that matter. How well, many have marched against APSA to pay back the, the apartheid loan, for and example? And insisted in doing that. Yeah, I think if we, if, if we come out from outside government and consistently attack the banks, there might be something happening. But also it's a question of uh, will there be no collusion? Remember, you, you can't march without permission. Therefore, will there be no collusion with the, with the authorities to then refuse you the right to do that? No, but I'm yeah. coming back to what you were saying, yeah. that we're not necessarily helpless. There yeah. is active citizenry. There's something mm -hmm. that we can do to not yeah. only compel government, but to also say, you know, as the uh, 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 consumers and South African citizens, we deserve better, and not to just let individuals have to fight a battle that is uh, insurmountable. What can be done is a good question. You one needs to sit down and speak, uh, create a forum for, for bankers and, and, and bank, who people, banksters and to people who are banking with banksters. There should be really for us something like, uh, I don't know, a police forum, a uh, cabinet forum. Or a special unit, investigative special, yes, unit. Yeah. Or continuously harassing the banks. You know, the banks don't like it, they can shut the doors, which they will never do. Mm. For example, why? Has South Africa to this day done nothing about to this day nothing about the billions upon billions looted on the information scandal of Dr. Connie Mulder, Dr. Ashley Rudy, John Foster? It goes back as far back as that. To this day, they've been looting from the fall of the Portuguese colonies in Africa, Mozambique and Angola. The South, the South African, something like 12 banks or 15 banks were involved, meaning that the majority of these banks were actually European banks, Swiss banks, German banks, Belgian banks, French banks, British banks. Yeah. They benefited from it. So an apartheid benefit, benefit, benefited many people in banks in particular. Yeah. So why is that not being attended to? To this day, well, why must we still pay apartheid loot? No, 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 because we, we, we somehow have selective <coughs> amnesia that mm. South Africa only started in 1994, and that's mm. why there is this whole um, resistance toward a, a wider mm. probe mm. when it comes to state of capture so that it doesn't only cover uh, events since 1994, as it were. Cindy, it's the narrative that was uh, uh, started in 1994. The Codesa discussion led to this narrative that you forget the past, you must move on. Uh, we, we were seen as radicals, we were seen as people who, who don't think straight by saying no, but you can't start here, you have to go back. Uh, and Because really it's true, the banks have benefited a lot. And not from, from 94, back, going backwards. In actual fact, I don't, I don't understand why the country had to pay apartheid debts in the first place, you know? But I, I, I think the, the deals that were signed in Condesa, that's what we need to go back and actually dismantle. Correct. Did you know that, for example, the ANC led South Africa in the beginning, from 1994 to 1996 or 8, somewhere around there, did not even have a Minister of Finance. We were gladly giving that Ministry of Finance to the apartheid people, apartheid experts in banking and mining, mm -hmm. I forgot the names now, who were then running the Treasury. Yeah. So that, that willingly giving that away, yeah, giving, uh, uh, willingly uh, giving things away. A yeah. concession, uh, a government as it were. We'll take uh, shots off the books that you have and put it up on our Twitter handle so that people can go and read up on this literature. But we're going to have to leave it there. That's Walter Lukuleni. He is the PAC Secretary for Publicity. Udo Hoza is an independent political analyst and columnist. Really appreciate your time. Now, on to other